Paul is back now with another installment of Stories of Service. Dan, you know, normally I'm meeting these World War II veterans for the first time when I show up to interview them, but not this week. Gus Villalta is somebody that I've known my whole life, and I'm excited to share his story today. As a kid, my favorite story to hear him tell was how during the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge, he had to climb the first tower and battle those fierce winds to run conduit for the bridge's electrical wiring. Turns out his experiences a few years after that were pretty interesting, too. And as it did for everyone in the greatest generation, World War II altered the course of his life. <laughs> Read the date of that. Somewhere. For best results, put in service before June 1929. <laughs> Those batteries are almost as old as the 1922 Gill Fill and Radio they powered, and they represent just the tip of the iceberg in Gus Valalta's repair shop, which could double as a museum of electronics. Where else can you find a car mounted 45 RPM phonograph? The shop's been a Los Banas fixture for nearly four decades but it wouldn't have ended up in the valley without World War II. July 11, 1941, I was drafted in the Army. Yeah. They knew I was doing radio at all times. See, they knew I had, they knew a little bit of radio, so they said... How well, did you get involved in radio? When did that start? That started in my early years, when I first came over from, the, to, from Italy to America. Mm -hmm. We were on a boat. A friend of ours that spoke Italian, and he showed me the radio room. And from then on, I was fascinated with radio, so I kept collecting all the radio junk that I could think of. Selling that junk, as he calls it, provided some money for his mother during the war. It's safe to say his supply has been replenished since, and it was the Army that helped feed his passion. They said I knew a little radio, so they sent me to Fort Monmouth to mm -hmm. learn further radio and they taught me a little bit of radar with the Englishman over there. He hadn't been there long when the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor brought a new urgency to his work. After December 7th, they picked me up off the road and said, soldier, come with us, you're going back to your base. And then he'd be off to California where he'd get his first taste of the town that would become his home. Seven of us were assigned to Los Manos. We were all confused. We didn't know we were going to Los Banas. Los Banas where? <laughs> the only place we could find, some guy told us that Los Banas was in the Philippines. <laughs> you know. So as we got to the top of the pass, a sergeant pulls out the papers and says, well, you're going to Los Banas, and it's a town in the middle of the San Joaquin Valley. The Army gave them a small radio and told them to monitor transmissions. They gave us a certain frequency to listen if we had, had to hear anything. There wasn't much to catch his ear, but a young lady named Carmela caught his eye and captured his heart. I chased, chased her till she caught me, of course, you know. They've been married ever since, but Gus's wartime adventures were just beginning. He'd set up FM radio outposts in San Francisco, then radar stations in Washington State. If the weather ever got cold, they knew exactly what to do. Our antennas were 30 by 40 feet arrays. Mm -hmm. And if you stand in front of them, you get warm. <laughs> it was now time to head overseas, and Gus knew exactly where he wanted to go. He says, I'd like to be assigned to Casablanca if I can, you know. I didn't want to go anyplace else. But... So he says, well, we'll see, you know. But because I spoke Italian, and I was an Italian immigrant, uh, they thought you were a spy. Boy, I'd say go on Mussolini. They had no doubts about his allegiances in the China-Burma-India theater, though, so off he went, zigzagging across the Pacific on the USS Butner. A shortage of radar men in CBI made Gus a busy man. Bombay, Calcutta, Bengal, then over the hump to China, where the Signal Corps loaned him to the 427th Night Fighter Squadron. In Burma, he would fly in P-61 Black Widows to check out their radar systems. He's sitting in the, in the way in the back over there. See with that little glass and uh -huh. We sat down like this in the radar. was a little screen like this. Uh -huh. And we checked that out to see if it worked. He has lighthearted memories of Burma, too, like a little GI game they played along the Irrawaddy River. And Michinal, we just got there, and Merrill's Marauders had just gotten through cleaning it up. There were bombs, unexploded bombs all over the place. We used to take our carbines and go out there and try to explode them. You're shooting them off. You're shooting them off, see. 
No one was hurt, but amoebic dysentery would take a toll on Gus. When the war ended, it was a pretty skinny GI holding up that celebratory headline. Now, more than 60 years later, you'll find a few military mementos scattered among his electronic treasures, but his view on what he did in the war is pretty unassuming. Does it give you a sense of pride that you're a part of that? Of what kind of pride do you call? I'm going to say, <laughs> yeah, I did my job, that's all. And he did it well. He did. And if you ever go to Los Banos, go downtown. His shop is still there, and you'll find him in there uh, a lot of the time. And there are just some absolute treasures in there. Oh, that's fascinating. He's a treasure. Thank you, Gus, for your <laughs> service to our country. And if you at home would like to get involved in preserving the stories of the Valley's World War II veterans, you can check out information on our website, cbs47.tv, or by calling that phone number, 445-0015. Thanks, Paul.